How do you say your last name? Kowalczyk. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody out there in Facebook land. This is Curtis Friesen and Tom Lancaster with the Adventure Effect Live. And today we have a very special guest, our friend and trainer, Carlo Kowalczyk. And Carlo is an ex sniper teams leader for the new Aus Australian military. And he, he is our coach with an organization called Restore Human. And, and at Restore Human, Tom and I have the privilege of working with his amazing and qualified staff to help us work with the asymmetries in our body to help us crush in the mountains for the long term. And his mission is to make humans unkillable. And we are going to be speaking with him today about our favorite topic, adventure as a gateway to the soul. And then we are going to move into his personal philosophy on how moving our bodies helps us move our consciousness. It is, of course, not the only piece of the puzzle, but it is a significant piece of the puzzle. And then we are going to talk about his personal mission to shift the consciousness of humanity globally by through his movement plans and ambitions. So Carlo, we're very pleased to have you here on the show and super pleased to be giving back after we've received so much from your staff at Restore Human. What do you have to say to us about adventure as a gateway to the soul? Uh, firstly, thanks so much for having me on, on the show. Uh, just interacting with you guys has been such a pleasure and, and really refreshing um, because, you know, that, that concept of adventure as a, as a gateway to so many things, but, you know, kind of, I, I think we're all, we're all searching for a little bit of deeper meaning. Um, and through my own personal experiences, I've, I've definitely led uh, parts of my life that weren't so adventurous and other parts that were maybe too adventurous in some ways. Um, and sort of, I've, I've, you know, over, over my years come to find something that's quite sustainable where I get to interact with people like yourself, the, the amazing team we have here at Restore Human, the amazing people we work with and sort of uh, li live a rich life. And, you know, I, I think we're, we're really privileged right now, like just the day and age we're in. There's so much choice, so many different adventures we can go on and so many different interpretations of that. Um, so I want to be around for a long time to be able to explore all those different avenues and and not just be, you know, sort of specialized in one little area. Um, and, that, and that's what's really exciting about the whole concept of adventure. It's really uh, pushing this idea of curiosity and, and, and where, you know, the kind of the stuff we do is just reinforcing that that doesn't need to be in a short time frame. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my, my immediate thoughts on it. Amazing. So, so I'd like to draw out this piece about the soul. When we're out on an adventure, how is it that adventure helps us connect to our soul? There's a, um, she's a psychologist out at Stanford, Kelly McGonigal. Uh, she's just written a book called The Joy of Movement. And, the, and there's an element in the book there that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting as, as a bit of a metaphor to what we're talking about here is talks about the, the, these two sort of brains we have, the, the social brain, and it's very much the, you know, we're interacting here. I'm thinking about like, you know, what am I saying is the right thing? Like, how do I look? Like, you know, what, what's gonna happen at, you know, when I finish work, what are the pressures they're gonna be? And, and that's one brain we have. And the, the other brain we have is more of this like forager brain where we're really, we're, so reliant upon our environment to, you know, back in the day to, to eat, to have shelter, to have all these different things. Um, and, and so we really become kind of like externally focused and we really start to notice that, oh, wow, look at that sunset. Like it's, it's beautiful, it's stunning, but hey, the color of it is, is maybe informing me about the weather tomorrow or hey, th there's, there's the, the movement of the bird and the tree. You know, what does that signify? And, and that kind of forager brain for the most part, we've really lost connection with that, um, you know, because you can get your food, you can get your shelter, you can get all these sort of things without really paying attention to that world. And, and instead, we spend so much time in this social brain. So I, th I think, you know, adventure is a gateway to the soul is, you know, I, I see the, you know, this idea of the soul and, and balance and, you know, kind of being able to experience awe 
and curiosity. You know, we like we have to kind of use adventure to take us back to those environments because we don't need to do it for our food and our shelter. So, you know, I, I think adventure is a it, it's it's the best tool we have that's really not getting used very well by, by people, you know. I love what you said about awe and curiosity. And maybe we could pull that thread just a little bit further and tease that out because I know when, you know, when I summit a mountain and I see the sunrise or the sunset, or I'm in an extreme environment, an environment that I would put myself in every day, there certainly is that sense of awe. And it's the curiosity that it gets us out there. But when we do, it's the awe is, it's a word that we don't use very often in our vocabulary anymore. What does awe mean to you? You know, to, to me, I, I do, I will deconstruct it sometimes in like, you know, those experiences of awe, we, we do have to go kind of chase them now and we do have to create them um, through adventure. And it, it's sort of like, it's tapping into, in some ways, like our more like raw, like just survivorship, like just trying to survive in these environments. And, that, and that's where all, you know, having those sensations sort of like, it reminds you that it's, it's important to go into those places and, and, you know, I, I think it's on a basic level of like survivorship of just getting enough food in, you know, being warm enough. But, you know, I, I think that that is really tied to our deeper sense of meaning and purpose. And, you know, I, and I think using those or inspiring, you know, experiences and memories to drive our day to day interactions is a much better way than the other way around, you know, because it, it just you know, we, we talk about a lot here at Restore Human, like, why, why, why the hell are we training, you know, kind of the, the physical fitness world, rehab world, it's, you know, in some ways, it's very lost, it, it doesn't have a lot of that external driver in a, in a healthy way, it's kind of, so about competition or aesthetics, you know, and what we talk about with, you know, the people we're working with and ourselves is like, what are the peak experiences in your life? You know, what are those peak experiences? And we find like, there's a pretty common thread it sort of relates to adventure. There's some sort of awe inspiring moment. You're with other people, you're, you're in, in nature. And like, you know, if that's your peak experience, why is it your Monday to Friday training helping to support more of that on the weekends or, you know, that big trip you do overseas, you know, instead of a lot of people are just like, Hey, I want to, I want to look better or I got to lift more than I did last time or whatever it is. And it's sort of, it's a, a bit of a shitty context, like having that direction of awe, um, we, we find is just kind of makes life even just like for all the staff and myself working here at Restore Human, like we, we just freaking love what we do so much because we know it's building to our peak experiences. Like just above me, we have a, a big uh, kind of 22 foot canoe up there on the roof that, you know, me and three of the other coaches, we did a 60 kilometer canoe trip from Jericho Beach out to, out to Gambier Island. And like, that was one of my peak experiences from last year. Um, and our training supported it. It was, it was awe inspiring, like the, the wildlife out there, be, you know, we had a bit of rain, a bit of inclement weather and just being had to have that physicality to go through that. But that was such a, a bonding time for us. And we could, we could talk business, we could talk relationships, we could talk all these different things in this, you know, amphitheater of just amazingness. So, you know, oh, I, I freaking love it. It's, that speaks to your previous point about, um, about social brain and, and forager brain. Like so much of the physical fitness industry is about that social brain. It's about how, do, how am I gonna interact with you as another human and am I gonna look good enough, right? Am I gonna come across well, rather than, <clears throat> rather than training to be fit in order to experience more of the things that we love and enjoy in life. 100%, and, and like to me, like that's where, you know, we, we, we all see the, the negative sides of ego kind of through that, 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 you know, focus It's like, and ego is great. Like having some ego I, I find is great because it, it keeps you fed, all those sorts of things. But quite quickly, the, the standard is that it's so like, yeah, me versus everyone else where all, all of a sudden, like we're quite literally rowing the boat all in the same direction because we're, we're inspired by these awesome environments and these awesome adventures. And, and then you get to, you know, like people go, you know, experiencing like you know doing plant medicine these different sort of activities to kind of tap into that and and lose their ego when it's it's really it's just out outside our front door you know 
Mm. And hearing you talk about this and the canoe trip and being able to talk business, it, it really reminds me of a conversation that we had with you about black days and how you're setting up your, your work structure and your work life. And the Black Days very much connect to that. Would you like to share a bit about your philosophy on Black Days? Yeah, for sure. So I um, don't know where I picked this up and we sort of developed it with you, you guys as well of like in the calendar, having specific sort of color coding to of different appointments, meetings, different you know duties, all that sort of stuff. And, and for me, like, you know, the studio here, we make money when we're training clients primarily, you know, we're taking people through, you know, prehab, fixing injuries, helping them build capacity if it's, athletes or if it's people with you know ms everyone in between so that's that's like revenue making time okay uh and then red is kind of like the admin okay going through the billing you know cra all that sort of stuff but then black time is sort of pull it pulling out of that and and working on the business not kind of in the business that's sort of sort of cliche term but like looking at okay what are the things we're doing to evolve and and sort of look at reaching a larger audience and you know Tom has been doing a great example of this, you know, like writing and, and transmitting the, the thoughts and, and just putting that up is, is like one of those black tasks. Um, so, you know, blocking off a whole day and like for, for me, for example, Thursdays are my, are my fully black day and then Tuesdays are a bit of a, a, a mix, black and a bit of admin. We have a, a team time meeting and that really allows me as you know, the, the guy who's running the, the show here to kind of like step out a little bit and get a bit of perspective. Um, and, and last year, sort of before COVID happened, actually a lot of Thursdays, the black days would actually go, my, my partner and I would go hike, we'd do say like ton of lofts, take the computer up, take the mobile phone, hike up there, start the day off with like an hour, hour and a half, you know, bit of, bit of going uphill and then bust out into some work, you know, take some food up, you know, it, it was, I think we did that for about maybe six or seven different Thursdays. And just to sneak that in, but still be ultra productive and have that um, natural environment really inform kind of decisions. And, you know, that that influenced some mind mapping I did and different writing projects with just training the staff on the methodology we have and building that together. Um, kind of stuff that just wouldn't have happened if I just stayed in the office behind me. It's such a uh, it's such a beautiful concept. And it's, it's something that we've also we work with other clients to to kind of bring that awareness to them and, and for us certainly some of our most productive days have been walking through the forest or going for a hike because yeah it's that change of context like when you're coming when you're going to the same place every day at the same time with the same people doing the same thing you're in a loop and there's no room for yeah. new thinking there's no room for new ideas new thoughts new um new creation but when you take all of the so it's very easy to find problems, right? It's very easy to find obstacles that we can't get past when we're in our same environment. But as soon as we remove ourselves from that environment and we get out into nature and we experience awe and we're curious about, you know, oh, that tree looks like a whatever, um, that change of context allows the subconscious to put all the pieces together. And suddenly you're like, oh, you know that problem that we've been dealing with for three weeks, this is the solution. And you would never get there by trying to force it through by trying to think your way out of it. And again, it comes back to the, the social forager brain. It's like, yeah. as you were, as you were explaining that, I was thinking like that the social is the kind of intellect in a lot of ways. And the, the forager is the connection to something bigger, the kind yeah. of the, the universal intelligence, whatever you want to call it. And, and when we can remove ourselves from our usual environment, and get out into nature, we connect with that universal intelligence and magic can flow through us. 100%. It's a, it's a incredibly useful like resource to us that for the most part, it's just not, it's not used in the right way, you know? Um, it's, it's really undervalued, hey? It is really undervalued. And I really, I really do think just as we're talking here, this thought has jumped into my mind and I'd love to share it because we're talking about adventure as a gateway to the soul so often. And, you know, there's people going out and walking into the forest and just doing a forest bath and forest bathing has become a thing. Um, and a thing that has a growing amount of momentum around it. And whether it's, you know, like Tom going and jumping in the ocean 
or forest bathing or going rock climbing or like even people who have been adventure athletes, they go forest bathing and they say it's a completely different connection to nature because you're there present to nature, not present to the experience that you're having in nature. And yep. this whole idea of connecting to nature and nature connecting us to our source, like you're saying, you go uphill for a little while and you bring your computer and your cell phone with you and ideas are popping that are really in alignment with your brand because it's what you're creating is, is the preconditions for people to go and have that uphill experience. And so when you go and have that uphill experience yourself, you're literally creating momentum that pulls your clients with you in that direction. And you're getting the information, the downloads that you need to do that. And that's why nature is such a powerful connector to consciousness. And, you know, there's been times where I've been tied to the side of the mountain in just a t-shirt and the wind's howling and I'm like shivering and I just stop and I can hear like the wind and the mountain and the plants speaking to me and guiding me through that experience. There's a really, when we feel like we're not going to be able to make it, there's a really powerful something else that we can tap into. And, and, and something else I think important is to bring up just from the example you, you sort of said, it came to mind, like, you know, sometimes people are getting out into nature on a regular basis, but they're doing it in that, like, hey, I have to run from here to A to B and get, you know, sort of crush this goal. Cause it's a little bit more for that social brain. Of like, okay, hey, this yeah. is how my time compares to this other person, or this is how it's going to make me look. And, and something I, I really like to do with, you know, people I go hiking with and that sort of stuff is like, just stop and, and sort of, find an area and just hang out and doesn't, you know, you don't necessarily have to meditate or anything, just, but just stop and notice and not be in a rush to get somewhere. And I know from my background, you know, being a, having been a sniper in the Australian military and that sort of thing is like, you know, a lot of, a lot of that occupation was like lying on your stomach, breathing in the forest and just noticing, um, you know, you could call it meditating, you could call, you know, whatever. And, and like, that's something that we naturally would have done so often because we're just getting from A to B in the woods, not wanting to get hurt by something or looking for food. And we'd have to be in that forager brain and you'd, you'd sort of get comfortable with not, not necessarily being bored, but not having to be crazy entertained or crazy stimulated by the next piece of information. Or, and, and I think just the, the culture we're in has detrained us out of that ability. So we kind of consciously have to bring ourselves back and, and take those pauses. You know, rock climbing is a great one because sometimes you're just stuck there, you know, some, someone's above you and you just got to hang out for a long time, you know, as they're figuring out the problem above you, you know? And so, so I think some sports and some practices are definitely more conducive for it, but. So you said something earlier, which just grabbed my attention, uh, which was the word prehab. Yeah. Um, which it, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's not a word that is in common usage. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about prehab and, and this could be like a nice segue into like your philosophy of movement. For sure. So co coming back to kind of, you know, we, we, we jokingly say it with a, a lot of clients and it's, on our, it's a, on our wall and sort of wooden letters is, you know, we're trying to make humans harder to kill. Um, and, and thankfully us in Vancouver here, you know, the, the more realistic thing is like getting a hip fracture. And, and, you know, making sure that it's not too severe. And, you know, so falling on the ice, those sorts of things are the things we need to prepare our clients for and ourselves, you know, me in Afghanistan is a different sort of context. Um, but, but ultimately, like if, if we're thinking about, okay, what, what's, what's gonna do me more harm, you know, and, and sort of zoom out again, kind of using that kind of awe inspiring lens to zoom out and not just be in the here and now, but, but jump, okay, where am, where am I gonna be when I'm 85? Um, you know, I think of like, hey, I want to be that, that grandfather who's like playing with the grandkids and like climbing mountains. And, and like, that's where a lot of my, my physicality training will, will, will sort of be based is in that realm. And to be thinking in that, that longer term side of things, doing prehab and, and pre looking at what injuries you might encounter, like say, I'll, I'll give you a little, little demo, like, you know, you, you go hiking and your knee might collapse in like this. So if you haven't been here for a long time, if you haven't tried doing say some some nasty looking squats like this under control you're gonna exceed what this knee is capable of because it just hasn't been there ever maybe so it's about like doing those kind of positions of unusual strength is what we call them and, and making sure your wrist and everything 
it's it's had sort of an exposure to falling down like with a lot of clients we get them to fall down you know but we teach them to roll out to do all these sorts of things because you know i i've even heard like two people already slipped over it was a bit bit icy not too long ago slipped over one's got a pretty bad concussion the other one's a little bit messed up through the arm and like we haven't even really had that much snow or ice this season in vancouver yet so you know it, it's making sure people are prepared for that and and so they can keep adventuring when they're shit 100 120 you know it's amazing i love it i love the just ever since i met you the the I mean, we've touched on this a few times through this podcast, but just your ethos of the purpose of training with you is to be able to enjoy life until, until forever, rather than yeah. to get giant biceps and impress the ladies or, or whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's such a refreshing it, thing in an industry that, as you say, can be quite lost. Yeah. It's strange at how uh, uncommon it is, you know, is like this idea of like, hey, let's train for lifelong adventure, you know, because if you know what you're training for, it really changes the training you do do. Um, and, you know, I, I used to run a CrossFit box downtown. I've, you know, I've trained in Argentina and Vietnam and I've, I've, I've been in all sorts of different training environments, rehab, prehab, you know, fitness, strength, and conditioning, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, and for, for the most part, a lot of the, the, a lot of the money, a lot of the kind of, you know, attraction is like really massive people are really you know fit crazy people competing um and and it's like yeah competition is useful but you shouldn't be competing every damn day of your life in a physical context where you have bad biomechanics because hey like shit life a lot of us have to sit down for our occupations and, and we can't all be professional athletes or or you know people gardening in idyllic sort of settings where they're always moving you know, most of us have had sort of large periods of being sedentary or, or on the flip side, you know, really hard labor work, a very repetitive work that wasn't necessarily the best thing for our body. And so it's like, hey, like, you know, that's where a lot of people fall. We need to treat the, the actual general populace. We don't need to be treating and making the best athletes even better. Like, you know, that, that's a, unfortunately, that's what a lot of fitness training is, is obsessed about is like the, the one, one percent. What, what's really interesting to me is you started to introduce a longevity conversation. Started to, you have introduced the longevity conversation. And I personally believe that longevity is so linked to our consciousness and what we believe is possible because there's two things that really predict the outcome of our actions. And that is the words that we use and the pictures that we create in our head. So when we're using language like this is killing me, um, you know, I can feel myself getting older, my body is disintegrating, that creates pictures of like walkers and wheelchairs and retirement homes and chronic illness. And that is such a common language. And we don't have this like fine wine conversation with our bodies. This like, I'm getting yeah. better with age. I'm getting faster and stronger and harder to kill. And that's the yeah. ethos that you're introducing. And you're really talking about like, let's generate a consciousness that leads to longevity, that leads to adventure when we're 60, 70, 80, 120, 180. Yeah. What's really possible when we start tapping into our consciousness and our words and our pictures and our actions, and we align those things all in the direction that we want to go. And, 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 you know, I think that's where taking inspiration from nature, it's like nature, nature's in it for the long game, you know? Yeah. Like, and, and, and humans, we, we all of a sudden become incredibly short-sighted, you know, even uh, the sort of the seven generation concept from the Iroquois, you know, that, that, that's, you know, seven generations, that is actually not that long, you know, but mm. for, for most people, it's hard for them to think outside of their, their selves, let alone their kids, you know, and, and, I, and I think, you know, adventure, sort of just being adventurous and doing like, say, a longer backpack camping trip or something like that, you start to you start to just have to appreciate future planning. It's like, oh, shit, I don't want to run out of food on day three, or hey, if I'm halfway up the 
the cliff face and I'm out of gear, like it's a really sort of shitty situation. But, you know, for the most part, most people don't have to deal with that until the consequences are too late, until they do have a heart attack, until, you know, they do have a fall and they just realize, hey, I haven't done any, any upper body strength. My bone density is super weak. And now I've hurt myself and now I'm going to start to train. You know, it's, it's not, never too late, but hey, if we can preempt that stuff by thinking sort of a little bit in the future, uh, it's, it's so much, so powerful. So powerful. This applies to not only to, to longevity and, and staying alive for longer and being healthy, but also to running a business, to managing a relationship, to um, really just all aspects of your life. If we can bring the spirit of adventure into these things, from the planning perspective, from the excitement about the unknown, the curiosity of what we're going to discover from the physical side of it, from like all of these aspects of adventure can bring us into a place where we can be exponentially successful in business, where we can have these incredibly powerful and enriching relationships um, and, and really just feel connected and aligned in, in everything that we do. Um, and yeah, I think the, the physical body, you know, the meat suit that we carry around with us is such an integral and important part of that. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I forget which psychologist it was that sort of popularized the, you know, the disconnection of the, of the body and the mind. And, and, you know, that, that is a prevalent need, pre prevalent idea in culture is that, Hey, there's, there's sort of two different things. And, and, you know, the more and more, you know, the scientific process is improving. We're seeing like the interaction of the gut biome and contracting and relaxing. Like, you know, by exercising, you change your gut biome. And now, you know, it, it's, you know, relatively well known that, hey, we have a second brain down here and our gut biome affects our mood, you know? And so like, there's an interplay of not just your physical hormones and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's affecting the, the, the way your food's getting processed. So, you know, it, it's really cool to see where we're at. And hopefully that knowledge is, the right knowledge is getting sort of spread, you know, faster and faster. And, and it is, it's just, you know, for, for me, it's a little bit frustrating to see um, all the distracting things that people get, you know, obsessed about and put all their time into instead of looking after their needs. On that note, just to not be a bunch of hypocrites here and, and be sitting down for the whole, whole hour we're going to be chatting, I, I reckon uh, we should do a, a little bit of joint articulation. What do you guys think? Let's do it. We have, uh, we have just like, two feet between us and the wall. Could, 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 could you guys do just some, some scapula circles even sitting down Absolutely. there? Mm -hmm. So your, your, your scapula, your shoulder blade, we can elevate, we can protract, we can depress, we can retract our shoulder blades. And if, if you're sort of clunky with this, that's okay. But we're trying to get this to be really nice and smooth. And we're really trying to build, especially some strength into this spot, kind of down into these muscles. And just going through, say about five in one direction, and then five in the other direction. Nice, easy breathing. Just keep the face relaxed. What's really interesting is Even just, just a little, a little ten bit seconds, of body stuff. How much heat is generated? Oh yeah, yeah. These, these don't look like much, but uh, kind of what, what I joke about is like a lot of a lot of guys will go, you know, and, and gals will go to the gym and do like and buys or chest and tries or sort of you know superset a body part with another body part but rarely do people work out their scapula their shoulder blade and it's responsible really for what your arms are doing it's, you know it's so pivotal to what's happening in your low back and you know kind of I, I find myself I'm in this position a bunch you know I've got my shoulders a little bit rounded over if it's hanging out on the couch and, and that isn't evil you know it's it just becomes an issue when we're there all the time we don't know how to hang out here a bit you know and it's it's kind of you know, for me, uh, there's a really awesome biomechanist down in the States named Katie Bowman. She talks about nutritious movement. And it's really kind of learning from nature. Hey, you know, move, movement outside, it's super nutritious. You think about all the angles your ankle goes on going up a hill compared to running on a treadmill. Your ankle's getting fed all these different angles. You know, your knee, all these sorts of things. Even just your sight, you have to look around. And that connection makes that ankle movement different. So... You know, if we can live sort of nutritious movement lives, we're more ready for the stuff outside. But then the effect that actually has on our brain in terms of brain-derived neurotrophic factors and, and that stuff's sort of like fertilizer for your brain. It just ma makes it grow. You know, movement has a direct effect on that. 
So then all of a sudden, not, not only is your movement more nutritious, your, your thinking's more nutritious. You've got better neuroplasticity, all those sorts of things. So it's, you know, talking about movement as a, a gateway to adventure, as a gateway to the soul and creativity and sort of manifesting the future we want. You know, it's a lot harder when you're not moving. It's still possible. It's still possible for sure. There's some amazingly creative genius human beings who don't actually move that much. But I say for the majority of us, it's almost like a, it's like, it's like water. It's like air. You, you have to have it. It's a non-negotiable. Yeah. On, on that note, what I find interesting is often if I go for a walk around the block, like in the city, yeah. I find that it ends up causing me pain. Like my, I have this issue with my psoas muscle, which can get aggravated just by doing something simple as going for a walk. Um, in, particularly if it's like slightly uphill or slightly downhill. But when I get out into onto a trail where the angles, as you said, are all, you know, all over the place and I'm having to use my balance and I'm having to kind of actually concentrate on the movements that I'm doing, that which on the face of it seems like it's going to be much harder work and cause much more issues for the body that actually has a really healing effect on my, on, on the physical yeah. issues that I have, um, which is quite fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we see that we see that so much, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, like pain, pain is a real thing. You know, a lot of people deal with pain from just going for a walk. And, you know, a big part of that is like our environments that we've been in, they used to be very nutritious. You'd have to balance, you know, like like you, like you going out on a hike, but we've we sort of like simplified everything. We've like gentrified everything. Like the, the paved ways, you know, pavements are all like super flat. You know, if there are some roots and starting to push out the concrete a little bit, like they'll come down, cut the tree and make it super flat, and, which is good. Like we, we do need some, you know, very accessible areas, but then we also need terrain that's challenging us. And, you know, like the, the Arbutus Greenway, it's just here in Kits. Like, it's a good example. They've, they've made like some, uh, they've used like wood chips on one area. It's a little bit, you know, undulating. It's got a, got a bit of a, a mix of terrain. And then you have the bike path. And then you've got just a, a regular path. For, you know, it'd be cool to see another one where there's some logs and there's some, you know, different rocks to hop over and all that sort of stuff, like, like we're, we're made for. And so people can kind of go in between. And, th and that's a part of a little bit of my longer term vision is, it's helping to try and inspire that sort of work of like, hey, you know, the environment we're in, like the city, we're all, we're all kind of stuck in it in a way because of our occupations. Like, you know, it'd be great if we could all live ideal lifestyles and in the mountains and all that sort of stuff, you know, but uh, we, we just can't do that collectively. But what we can do collectively is really upgrade the, the environment we're in in terms of the urban environment. And, and that's where... You know, I, I'm really excited for the future of like automated cars and all these sorts of things where potentially we can free up some of the, the, the roadways and start to put more of these kind of Arbutus greenways into play and have nature coming back into the city and, and having adventure literally out front, outside of our front door. And, it, and you know, we talk about adventure, you know, I, 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 I do a bit of skiing, those sorts of things. It's like we need environments that are a little bit challenging. And constantly, we've just been taking the challenge out of our environments. So, you know, if it isn't challenging, it's sort of a little bit boring. You know, we, we, we want that excitement, we want that challenge. And, and, that, and that's where sometimes I'll even like, just, you know, like we've got things like these sticks and all that sort of stuff. Like we'll purposely leave the studio a little bit, you know, messy, the, the movement studio we're in, or, or even at home, we'll just sort of like, you know, leave that across the stairway and, and have to go over the top of that or occasionally just crawl up the stairway and make small modifications like that. So it's, it's a little bit challenging. It's not as, as fun as going down, you know, some downhill skiing, but you've got that element of, hey, I, hey, I have to pay attention to my environment. I can't just be like doing this on my phone. You, you've taken yourself there, but I was gonna segue into a concept of ours, which is comfort management. Um, and you, you touched on that, like we've made everything so safe. The pavements are all flat. We yeah. don't even walk upstairs. We go in the escalator or we go in the elevator. You know, the cars are designed so that we don't feel the bumps in the road. Like everything is so safe. Yeah. And what, you, what you're alluding to there is adding risk on some level in a manageable level back into our lives. Yeah. So, and this is, this is something that we talk about a lot. And, you know, when you're talking about rock climbing or, or skiing or kayaking, like obviously there's a huge element of risk. Yeah. 
in that and you know you should never do something like that unless you are with someone with you know if you're experienced yourself or you're with someone who is experienced but i'm interested to um to get your perspective on what happens when we reintroduce risk into our lives and what the impact is of, of not having that risk yeah for sure um there's a so you know when we talk about like toxicity you know like too much of anything is, is bad you, know, you eat too much chocolate over christmas you, you have a sore stomach it's it's bad you know? um and and there's this thing called the laffer curve um if you've never sort of heard about the laffer curve i suggest you you know do a quick search and it's essentially this kind of you know curve where within this range of the curve like happy days you know as soon as we start to go too far then you know there's going to be problems and, and that exists pretty much in every, everything like you know like how much should i deadlift you know there's, there's a certain amount of like weight that's healthy to deadlift at a certain point you have to be spending so much if you damn time practicing a deadlift that if you aren't a powerlifter and aren't making money doing it or you know it, it, it's just nonsensical and the same thing is really with risk like if we're, we're taking it out then we we are gonna we're gonna stagnate like just our brain's not gonna be given the challenges to, to keep adapting and, and like the brain is just like our muscles if, if you aren't feeding it it's gonna atrophy and you know that's one of the things i'm concerned about longer term is, is cognitive decline like, you know, being 85 and my, and my grandfather unfortunately passed away with be severe cognitive decline. And, you know, he, he wasn't getting sort of the, the risk and the challenge um, that, you know, his brain would have otherwise in, in a different environment. So, you know, if I can set up the conditions for, for an environment where I can have those risks and keep stimulating my brain and my physical self, then I, I can push that off. You know, and the evidence is there, like exercise, all, all these different brain trainings. There's so many amazing scientific studies now showing that we can push cognitive, cognitive decline away. Um, you know, the, the idea that I see a lot of the time, unfortunately, that people get a bad taste in the mouth when it comes to risk is they're seeing like, they're seeing again, those top one percenters. They're seeing those specialists who just like, they're the best downhill skiers in the world. And all of a sudden they're doing this, you know, these other more extreme things. They need more and more challenge because they've chosen kind of a pretty narrow realm. And the only way through that narrow realm is kind of more and more extreme. And then, you know, they're backcountry skiing and, and unfortunately they die or, you know, three of their buddies die. There's a, there's a great Patagonia film uh, called Solving for Z that just came out about this amazing, you know, mountain ski guide. But like when, when you stick to that one realm, it can really end and, and poorly. So that, that's where I like to kind of almost diversify my risk. You know, I like to go do some climbing. I like to go do some hiking, some, you know, long distance trail running, all that sort of stuff, some canoeing. But I don't, I don't need to kind of prove it to anyone that, hey, I'm, I'm going to be the best damn long distance canoeer or whatever it is. But for the people who are, and that's the thing, that, 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 that's great. But, you know, unfortunately, there's, there's, I'd say, kind of more inherent negative risk to that because then all of a sudden your identity is really in that space. Like, hey, if that's your occupation, go for it. But if it's not, not your occupation, Diversify, find those nutritious challenges so you can keep doing it for a long time. I don't know if that was, I might have just gone off a bit of a tangent there, but I, I love the idea of risk and, and sort of choose your struggle before it chooses you, mm -hmm. you know? What you've done really beautifully is you've tied in the concept of adventure and identity and, and how people choose this narrow bandwidth and they need to keep pushing it further and further. And I feel like adventure and identity are actually less tied together at that level than they are at the like high intermediate level or low intermediate level where like yeah. people are like, oh, I'm a weekend warrior, I'm gonna do this. And they're like, they're climbing in pursuit of something. And whereas athletes at the top of the game are more connected to a feeling then they are yeah. connected to a accomplishment right yeah and of course they're they're looking for that next piece of neural stimulation that next experience but they're connecting to something really deeply intrinsic and that's what's allowed them to get to that point it's the yeah. it's the extrinsic drivers that social part of the brain that lead us into injury mm -hmm. and when we're able to let go of those extrinsic drivers and tap into the intrinsic reasons to be on an adventure, to be on, 
to be in the joy of the experience, to be in the pleasure of the experience, to be in the like, you know, there's two mindsets you can have when you're on an adventure. Like this is a grind and I'm going to be really glad when it's over and, and people adventure from there. People climb from there. I know I have for sure. Um, And what I'm starting to tap into more and more is the joy of the experience. And when we go out in, in immersing ourselves in the joy of the experience, rather than the pursuit of accomplishment, those are two different drivers and it really changes our relationship to the environment, to ourselves and to the people that we engage with. Which again, ties back to the, the social forager brain. Just as you say that, like if I'm, if I'm chasing the accomplishment, what I'm chasing is the ability to tell someone about that accomplishment. Yeah. To post it on social media, to be a hero, to, you know, whatever, to inspire others rather than, for the curiosity, for the adventure, for the, um, the, the experience of awe that comes from stepping into the unknown and yeah. figuring stuff out. And what's really interesting yeah. is what Tom has just brought up is that immersing ourselves in the joy of the experience actually fuels the social side of our brain because when we go out, you know, let's say I talk to somebody about snowshoeing up a mountain and they've just been walking on pavement for six months. And I tell them, oh, I snowshoed up this mountain and it was so good and it was so high and it was so hard. And they're like, whoa, like I can't even relate to that, right? And, And I'm talking about the accomplishment. We did it in this amount of time and we were the first ones up and 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 they're like, whoa. But if we're like, man, we got to see the sunrise on this mountain and it was beautiful and being in an environment where it's full of snow and it was quiet and it was so serene. I just, uh, I dropped into the nature and my soul felt so connected. All of a sudden that actually feeds the social connection. But I'm not talking about the accomplishment. I'm talking about my, the joy of my experience. And when we can translate the joy of our experience, that adventure goes from the fringe of our life to the center. And it makes people, it invites people to like, people want those feelings. They want to experience the joy, the serenity, the awe, the curiosity and the play. And, and to, to share that with people, but just the pure joy may invite people into adventure that we never even knew wanted to go on into adventure. But when we're in this like hardcore, purist, alpinist, weekend warrior, extreme attitude, there's a really select amount of people who want to go play in that space. And sometimes the people who want to play in that space with us aren't that fun. Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. And I I think it's it's just more sustainable, you know, Mm. living in that joy and, and, you know, to attach the numbers. And and that's where I, I think we need to not just throw the numbers out, and, and the achievement side of stuff, like I think they're useful tools, you know, it's like the, there's, there's great things to be said about measure, you know, like measurement is, is useful, but if that's your whole mindset, that's, that's you know, quite potentially a very destructive mindset and, and it pushes people away. Um, so, you know, finding the right amount of that. And then I think like, you know, you guys, I think just generally you exude that, just, you know, chatting to you guys sort of in person or across this, it's like, you can, you feel the joy you have for, you know, the work you do. And, th- and that, that's like, it's super charismatic. It's like, it makes me want to be around you guys. And, and that's what we find with coaches here and the, t- the people attracted to us is like, we're just stoked. Like, it doesn't matter if you went for, you know, a two kilometer walk through Jericho Park Forest here, or you did a 50K. Like, it, it, it really doesn't matter to us. It's all challenging to people in different ways. But the joy felt is, is the same joy. Of like, oh, wow. You know, the, I, I went out and I thought it was going to be shitty because it's raining. So I put my jacket on and went out anyway. And just the smells, it was like a completely different forest. And that could be from someone, you know, doing, doing a 50K or doing a 2K walk. It doesn't matter. Something that's bringing me joy right now is the fact that it seems to have stopped raining. And after this, I have to go oh, really? and jump in the ocean. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, feeling, I'm feeling pretty joyful about that. Yeah, nice. I'm, I'm intrigued. You, you have um, this stick 
which yep. you've, you've introduced to us a couple of times. Um, obviously, people listening to this on the, the audio only podcast won't be able to see that. But I'm curious, what is it? It, it looks like a broom handle. Um, uh, why, essentially, why it's just it's essentially it's a dowel. I also I'm on a bowl as well. I'm doing a little bit of release work on my calf as I talk to you guys. Um, I'm sitting on a sitting on a sandbag just so I can have my hips in this kind of different position than say sitting in a chair. And, and you know, I, I hope I don't come across as fidgety, but, but to me, um, I try and remove as much op optional sitting from my life as I can. You know, I love to sit down at a cinema and watch a film or sometimes just, you know, watch Netflix. But, you know, if I don't have to be sitting, I'd rather be standing or just in a nutrition hip position. And like the stick here, like simple tools, like, you know, we, we don't have crazy machines in Restore Human. Like, you know, we have like, a-frames to hang ropes off and that sort of stuff. I mean, we do have a rowing machine. It's, it's a useful way of doing some, some conditioning work, but for the most part, like the ground, a stick, you know, a ball, like you, you can have so much fun and joy and build like legitimate muscle and build legitimate balance and that sort of stuff. Like, you know, the stick, the, the really great exercise we like to take people through to teach them of what their shoulder is, is capable of is just like bringing it across the body, coming through, you get to work your wrist here a little bit. And so it's just kind of like, simple tools to to keep the body healthy um and you know it, it asks that like how curious can you be how many ways can i use this stick how many ways can i use this ball you know what pops it's, for me, it, it's fun what, what pops for me as you say that is the the kid who who's like two or three years old and they get the the newest shiniest toy that's like however many yeah. hundred dollars and and they're more interested in the wrapping paper they're more interested yeah, in the box yeah. that it came in than this shiny thing where it makes noises and dances around. Uh, yeah. I love the simplicity of it. And, yeah. and again, it's that curiosity of what can I do with this? Mm -hmm. um, which is, a, a you can do that with anything in your home, right? And you could take a chair, you could take a table, you could take a, well, you know, whatever I've got. This is a, a reflective band for my, to keep my, to keep my pants away from the gears on my bike you just find a thing and be like huh i wonder how i can use this in a different way right and it stimulates yeah. that that adventure part that curiosity part of your brain and maybe you discover something completely wild 100 and, and a lot of the time like we find in, in our experience in here like more useful um you, you know you, you end up building more proprioception more body awareness by just using the ground for a lot of things what weights aren't bad you know machines aren't bad it's just sometimes they're, they're prioritized too much. They, they have their purpose, they have their place, but you know. Yeah. Well, the thing with the machine Love it. is it's specifically designed to isolate one muscle group. Yeah. Generally, right? And, and, and often, unfortunately, people are initiating ways that they're not even maybe using their muscle group, you know, <laughs> as good as they can. Anyway, so it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a hole to go down. Mm -hmm. So, you're based in Vancouver. Yep. Um, do you, uh, people are likely to be kind of tuning into this from all over the world. Do you, if, if people are kind of getting a vibe from what you're, what you're saying and, and want to work with you, like how do people do that? Can you work with people online? Do you, um, like where should people come? How can they find out more about you? For sure. So, so like, you know, it, it's in the name, like we're still human. Like we really do value the human part um and and like i'll just be blunt we rather work with people in person you know like that that's you know there's just so so much richness to that experience um so if people are in vancouver we really highly suggest you know depending on cover level of covid and all that sort of stuff is to come down in person we're wearing masks and we've got all the precautions in place um but then you know we are we we're proficient at technology you know, we, we, we're training people in South Korea, England, that sort of stuff. We do it virtually. And it, it requires a little bit more problem solving. We've had people, uh, we had a gentleman who flew over from South Korea, did some work with us. And then it's nice to have that occasional bit of, you know, one-on-one -on -one sort of in-person time. Um, but we can definitely adapt to the virtual realm. And, and you know, kind of what we do is, is very different than a lot of the stuff out there. We're, we're more focused on physical literacy you know, just as we're taught maths in school, unfortunately, we're never really taught like, you know, concepts of maintaining our body for the long term. Um, and, and we kind of do need to be taught that if we've, you know, been sedentary for a large portion of our life. Because when we're sedentary, we're not moving, 
If you don't use it, you lose it. You lose that kind of physical capacity sometimes. And quite often, even people who have kept it up, um, they start to lose the, the, the literacy of like knowing and being actually aware of what, what they're doing. You know, they're just sort of just a natural act. Um, so we, we really come in from that other, other side and we build people's awareness, we build their capacity up and we can do, do that virtually. We can, you know, we, we really want to spread what we're doing, um, but doing, doing it, you know, for us, high standards and proof are, are paramount. Um, so we, we will only work with people who are like really committed to going, you know, doing it longer term. Um, and, and we're not about like, we don't want people to train with us for, for life. We want to empower, we want to educate. And we need people who you know, want to take responsibility. Um, and it's a little bit scary. Like, you know, there's a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of pain associated with the body. So we're very cognizant of that. And, and it's just finding that right match in terms of coach and, and then what the person wants to do. So we're, we're adaptable. If so you want to come work with us. If, if someone is watching this, what are the questions that they're asking themselves that you have the answer to? Does that make sense? Yep, yep, for sure. Uh, there's a term we, we've coined called in, infosynthesis. Infosynthesis. So, so just synthesizing all the information out there. Like there's millions of like videos on YouTube, different tutorials, all that sort of stuff. And and like what what we're what we're very good at is is taking the latest science, taking the latest you know, different methodologies, and, and applying it to you and sort of curating the stress. So if if you've hurt yourself before, you know, training, if you're unable to kind of rehab from from an injury those sorts of things you have these you know questioning questioning sort of doubts is like we can clear that up and give you sort of like the no bs answer because like it's what we we do day in day out we, we've had our own injuries we've worked with such a swath of people and, and for us it's we're very like method centric it's not just a bunch of different random trainers we're all using the restore human method we're all building on it and and you know sometimes the answer isn't pretty sometimes it's not the nicest answer but we'll, we'll we'll tell you the truth in terms of like what's actually going to get your cells to adapt it's not just about a short-term pain relief but how do we build your capacity up and maybe you don't get any pain relief a lot of the time we'll get people reducing their pain a lot but hey if we can build up the capacity so that when you fall when you go adventuring you can do so more with more confidence um like you know people who, who want to figure that out and and like i'll be frank it isn't it isn't easy I've been doing this shit for a long time now. I've, I'm, you know, I've got a, a diverse background. I've flown around the world, seen all these different people. It isn't super straightforward. I, w I wish it was easier. I wish physicality wasn't such a tough thing, um, but we kind of, we shine the torch in the right direction. Amazing. So we will, um, well, what's your, how do people get in touch? What's your, contact information sure uh like, like like the best way is just through our website restorehuman.com uh we're on we're on instagram that sort of stuff we, we have some videos up on our youtube there's a bunch of free content there as well that people can dive into we have i think we have a series of 40 videos uh called hike fit all based off you know sort of the building blocks of just getting out there and hiking with confidence it doesn't even need to be sort of anything extreme so that's all on youtube just look us up restore human there um and then feel free to just shoot, shoot me an email Con contact at restorehuman.com i check all that stuff I, I run all that sort of stuff so if you have any questions like we just want to help people adventure and and do so su sustainably so if you if you want to work with us hit, hit us up well you definitely get our seal of approval as curtis mentioned at the beginning of the show we've been we've been working with your coaches um for uh for a few months now and um you know, I can speak personally to the, the videos and the content that you put out. It's amazing stuff. And it's, uh, and it, it's, it's easy to integrate and it's meaningful and it has a lasting impact. So you definitely, definitely get the seal of approval from us. Yeah. Um, so our group, the group. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about our group. So, well, first of all, Carlo, thank you so much oh, wow. for, <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for, for this incredible conversation um it feels like every every episode of this podcast we do we're like that was the best one ever um but uh, but this really was the best one ever. <laughs> this really was the best one ever. We, we really enjoyed it and uh for anyone watching if you have enjoyed the concepts that we've been talking about um in this podcast we are really excited about our new group program that is launching in february why don't we tell carlo about it 
let's just talk. Yeah, tell me all about it. And let everyone else listen in. Okay. So, um, just tell Carlo. Uh, I mean, no. Derailed my thought process. I have derailed your thought process. Um, so the group program starts in February. It's called the Zenith Project, and um, it is a six-month mastermind for adventure conscious entrepreneurs. So what is an adventure conscious entrepreneur? It is a, a business owner, a founder, uh, or someone who wants to start a business of some sort that is in some way going to enrich humanity, whether it's, you know, like yourself through, through physical literacy and movement, whether it's coaches, whether it's someone who is building a tech platform that's going to change the way that we do things in a certain way. Um, anyone who is actively contributing to the enrichment of humanity through their work, um, who is interested in this concept of operating in the unknown. So for us, we define adventure as any environment that is uncontrolled where the outcome is uncertain. Uh, so by that, by that metric, business is an adventure, relationships are an adventure, mountains are an adventure. Um, so, and, and really it's about the, um, the, the mindset the attitude that uh, that goes with adventure. Uh, and then the consciousness part is uh, what we've alluded to in this conversation. It's like, how does this, how does stepping into the unknown, taking risks, managing the level of comfort in your life, getting out into nature, how do all of these things affect our consciousness and the way that we, the, the connection that we feel to our work, to our partners, to ourselves, to, to the universe, God, uh, and how can we bring all of these things together and find that sweet spot in the middle of adventure, entrepreneurship, and consciousness? So we're really excited about the people who are getting involved uh, already. Um, it's going to be a small group of 20 people. And uh, we are going to work together over the, over the course of the six months from February to, to really kind of co-elevate, support each other, lift each other up. Uh, we're going to bring our best coaching into the group uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So if uh, you or anyone watching is interested, uh, please do check out vortexstrategy.com forward slash Zenith project, uh, vortexstrategy.com forward slash Zenith project. Uh, and we would love to talk about how we can support you in that way. Sounds awesome. Sounds like an adventure. Absolutely. And it's not just focusing on that extrinsic, like getting out into wild spaces adventure. It's also focusing on that, like really deep, intimate relationship with ourselves mm -hmm. and getting down to like our core desire to be loved, which is really why we do everything. And when we express from our core desire to be loved, when we express from that joy, we have a more con pure connection with ourselves, our environment and the people around us rather than trying to be validated or significant or um, recognized or any of these safe or um, free, all of these things, they cause friction in our relationships. But when we just put it out there and we're like, look, I just, I want to be loved, right? That's my desire. That's my need in this moment. Do you love me? Um, and, you know, and just allowing ourselves to genuinely connect as humans with ourselves our environment and each other it's a game changer so we're uh, that's what i really love it love about you guys it's like uh you know working with you guys you really feel that or and you don't need to be on the top of the mountain like you feel that all from you guys and you feel it in yourself and it's such a such a beautiful thing like you, you guys are awe inspiring in, in true sense thank you thank you and the same very much goes for you it's always a pleasure to share space with you to share oxygen with you um and um yeah thank you so much for this uh, this has been an enlightening chat and um yeah so everyone please do make sure you follow us on uh, on uh, all the socials on youtube uh, click subscribe follow restore human as well if you want more physical literacy uh, in your life and you want to live to 150 um and we okay, will no guarantees 100 <laughs> percent money back guarantee from carlo if you don't live to 150 um, that's all for this week signing off signing off we love you we love you Beautiful. keep adventurous see you